In 1934, an 89-year-old woman traveled back down the Santa Fe Trail to Fort Union. Her name was Marion Sloan Russell, and she had come here as a girl, fallen in love and married. But the fort was no longer the lively place she remembered. I found great crumbling walls and tottering chimneys. Great rooms stood roofless, their whitewashed walls open to the sky. The wind moaned among the crumbling ruins and brought with it the sound of marching feet. I saw with eyes that loved to look backwards a wagon train coming along the old trail. I saw a child in a blue pinafore. It was a little maid Marion on the seat of a covered wagon, Marion Sloan Russell. In its 40-year existence, Fort Union became the largest and most important outpost in the region. The fort helped protect commerce on the Santa Fe Trail, played a critical part in the Civil War, and was home to the area's finest medical center. Its role as supply depot shaped the Southwest for decades to come. Fort Union's time has long since passed, but its legacy lives on. For centuries, American Indians used travel and trade routes that later became part of what is now known as the Santa Fe Trail. In 1821, trade between the United States and the new Republic of Mexico was welcomed, and wagon loads of goods began moving back and forth along the route that stretched from western Missouri to Santa Fe. The United States declared war on Mexico in 1846, and soon after, the Army of the West marched down the Santa Fe Trail into New Mexico. In the central plaza at Santa Fe, General Stephen Watts Kearney claimed New Mexico territory for the U.S. and guaranteed protection for all citizens from what he called the Indians and all their enemies. In 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo ended the war, and with the land now part of the United States, it became necessary to establish a permanent military presence. The military authorities wanted to protect traders coming into New Mexico. The trade was so important to the United States and to the new territory. This country, of course, was the hunting ground of the Hickory Apaches and, and the Ute peoples. Naturally, they resented the intrusion. Colonel Edwin V. Sumner was directed to devise a new system for protecting the Southwest and putting defenses in the heart of Indian country. He decided to build the first Fort Union out on the frontier near the confluence of the mountain and Cimarron branches of the Santa Fe Trail, along Wolf Creek, at a place known as Los Pozos, the Pools. Construction began in 1851. The fort and quartermaster supply depot were built quickly by the soldiers themselves, using mostly green, unhewn logs. Katie Bowen, wife of Captain Isaac Bowen, wrote frequently to her family back east. We are putting up quarters as fast as possible of timber and adobes. And in the meantime, we are living in tents. Bowen later speculated in her journal that the rough quarters were due to what she called Colonel Sumner's excessive economy. In two years, Fort Union had a fairly impressive assembly of buildings, including a hospital, mechanic's shop, and what one soldier called a good bakery. By 1856, however, shoddy construction took its toll. The fort was falling apart, and with constant talk of secession in the east and rumors of Confederate action in the southwest, it soon became clear that Fort Union 
would need more substantial defenses. In July 1861, Major William Chapman started work on the second Fort Union, one mile to the east and away from the base of the bluffs. The earthen field works, later mistakenly referred to as the Star Fort for its eight-pointed design, were hastily and shabbily built, also by the soldiers themselves. By June 1862, Captain Peter Plimpton not only pronounced the quarters very objectionable, but was convinced the site was still in range of artillery fire from the bluffs. To prove his point, he had cannons fire shells from the bluffs Fire! that easily reached the new fort and beyond, confirming the captain's concerns. Fortunately, Fort Union was never attacked. But only three months earlier, Confederate forces had been poised to do just that. With the shelling of Fort Sumter in 1861, soldiers across the country were forced to decide if they would remain loyal to the Union or return to their homes in the South. Among them was a former commander of Fort Union, Major Henry Hopkins Sibley, who resigned his commission in May of 1861 and joined the Confederacy. He raised an army in Texas and by early 1862, began his move up the Rio Grande Valley, defeating Union forces at the Battle of Valverde and occupying Albuquerque and Santa Fe. On March 26th, the Confederates met a Union force out of Fort Union at Apache Canyon. The fighting raged through the canyon with the Confederates suffering heavy losses. Over 400 strong, the Union force was comprised of Colorado volunteers, known as Pikes Peakers, regular Army soldiers, and New Mexico volunteers. The New Mexico volunteers were New Mexican Hispanos, who despite being subjected to prejudice and insults, proved to be loyal troops. The New Mexico volunteers wanted to be an active part of the new America. They had a sense of patriotism and a sense of uh, citizenship, a sense of wanting to be a part of the active, developing fabric of, of American society. On March 28th, Confederate troops advanced up the Santa Fe Trail through Glorieta Pass. There, they repulsed an attack by Union forces led by Colonel John P. Slow. But the Confederate celebration was cut short when word arrived that a detachment of 488 men under Major John M. Chivington and guided by New Mexico volunteer, Lieutenant Colonel Manuel Chavez, had flanked the main front, destroyed the Confederates' wagon train, and burned all their supplies. It was effectively the end of Sibley's assault on New Mexico and the Confederate presence in the Southwest. U.S. troops and volunteers from Fort Union had helped turn the tide. In 1863, commanders abandoned the Star Fort and set to work on the third Fort Union, this time using skilled local builders and craftsmen. It was to be the largest fort in the southwestern United States and supply depot to a network of forts that protected the expansive territory. When photographer and physician William A. Bell visited the post with a railroad survey party in 1867, the fort was humming with activity. Fort Union is a bustling place. It is the largest military establishment to be found on the plains. It is the supply center from which the 40 or 50 lesser posts are supplied with men, horses, munitions of war, and often with everything needed for their support. Fort Union was an outpost of American civilization here in the Southwest. You had all those Americans, whether they would be commercial traders, soldiers, politicians, doctors, 
They all had to come to Fort Union before they went to the capital of the territory in Santa Fe. The fort and its supply depot transformed the region's traditional subsistence agriculture and bartering system to a cash economy. There's no question but that economically it made a great contribution to the surrounding community and therefore to the native Hispanic population. The fort required tons of feed for horses and mules, supplies for soldiers and families, and the local economy flourished. Fort Union's hospital was one of the largest west of the Mississippi. The facility treated the public as well as the soldiers and their families. From 1871 to 1874 alone, 2,174 patients were cared for and only 17 died. There were several companies of Buffalo soldiers that were stationed here at Fort Union. They were black soldiers, but they were charged with the same responsibilities as any other soldiers that were stationed here. In any Western fort, there was constant drill. Genevieve La Tourette, daughter of the post's chaplain, recalled the garrison's daily routine. It began with the rising of the sun, firing of the cannon and hoisting of the flag, followed by the bugle sounding call for breakfast, after which there was drilling of various kinds, target practice, dinner and more drilling, and later in the day, recreation, retreat after sunset, firing of the cannon as the flag was lowered. Without the amenities found in the East, many Army families found living at Fort Union a challenge. Roofs often leaked, the wind was relentless, and the monotony of military life took its toll. But most families made it their home. The fort had its own band, baseball team, schools and play areas for the officer's children, sutler or post store, chapel services, dances, and many opportunities for soldiers to engage in a friendly game of cards. In 1878, the Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad made its way over Raton Pass and into New Mexico. Two years later, the tracks reached Santa Fe. It was the beginning of the end of the Santa Fe Trail and Fort Union. The bustle of the supply depot slowly quieted and in 1883 stopped altogether. While some troops remained, in 1891, the fort was abandoned for good. When Marion Sloan Russell returned to Fort Union in 1934, she was saddened to find a much different place. Workmen were busy tearing down the old fortifications, and they tore my heart down with it. Why not let the old walls stand? Around each crumbling wall, each yawning cellar hole, are gathered precious memories of a young America. Marion Russell died two years later, but her plea to let the old walls stand became a reality following a quarter century of organized efforts by local citizens. Their work to preserve the abandoned site included everything from fundraising bake sales to lobbying Congress. And on June 28, 1954, Fort Union National Monument was officially established. Today, Fort Union National Monument preserves another time. A time when the fort was a great center of commerce and activity in the Southwest. Though the route has long been abandoned, the Santa Fe Trail is still etched into the landscape. The ruts of wagon wheels and ruined workshops 
still echo the stories of the thousands who came before. And Fort Union stands as a living monument to a young America.